The other thing that I've found, especially people who've had a career in corporate America like I had, I tell people my body left IBM in 2006. My mind caught up in 2009. <laughs> there's a way of there's a way you think when you've been an employee your whole life. Mm. When you are out on your own, you have to switch a lot of that thinking. Sometimes it's, it's the exact opposite. For instance, when I was with IBM, the brand was IBM. And I needed to not do anything to mess that up, to not tarnish the brand. It wasn't me walking into a customer's office. It was the yeah. company IBM. Yeah. So there was this rule that you created a healthy professional distance with your customers. Well, when you're in a small business, the brand is you. When you walk into a customer's office, you're representing yourself. And you want to get to know that customer very well because it's people to people, it's person to person, individual to individual, and they need to know, like, and trust you specifically. So that's one of those cases where the rules just flip. Thank you for listening to the Guys Who Do Stuff podcast. Visit guyswhodostuff.com. You probably shouldn't Google that. All right, welcome to the Guys Who Do Stuff podcast. I'm Joe. I'm Josh. And this is the show where we help you get unstuck, tell a better story, and have a good answer to the question, what are you doing today? And today, we are honored to have with us Katie Gales. Uh, we just would love to start out by just telling us a little bit about yourself. Oh, you didn't tell me I'd have to talk about me. Oh, come on now. <laughs> no fair. Well, I am a North Carolina native. I know that's rare. Winston-Salem. Actually, I was born in Oxford, North Carolina, in oh. Granville County, which is still a rural county, but I grew up in Winston-Salem. I hear that. We have that in common. That's right. That's Birth, right. Birthplace of this guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go Black Demons, R.J. Reynolds yes, High School. Black Demons. My daughter's school is the imps. Like, we have a thing for demons around here. Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To be in the Bible Belt, that is a little strange. Yeah. It is. So I grew up in Winston-Salem and went to Bennett College for Women in Greensboro. Had a long career with IBM. Went to the Duke Fuqua School of Business and left and started a consulting practice focused on small businesses. Worked for the North Carolina Rural Center for a while in a program called Growing America Through Entrepreneurship. And this was started during the recession when a lot of people were being put out of work. And so I worked with people in North Carolina's 85 rural counties to help those people who'd been displaced figure out how to start a small business, basically create a job for themselves based on whatever their skills and interests were. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of fun. Most of my clients I didn't meet. I worked with about 150 or so companies and, or individuals. And I think I met 20 of them, but all of the work was done by phone. And then I ended up at, at Wake Tech. And so what's your role specifically at Wake Tech right now? I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship Initiatives, which is a cross-college function aimed at uh, developing entrepreneurship, like tying Wake Tech to the entrepreneurial culture and economy that's developing, but also bringing that energy back into, into Wake Tech. We've had multiple guests on the show who have all said something very similar about how awesome our community college is in yes. the area. Yes. So what do you think is some of the contributing factors why it's, it stands head and shoulders? Because these aren't people that are paid to talk about it. These are guests that we've had. I and I'm like, I am paid to talk about it. So you know <laughs> nice, I'm going to <laughs> say good things. But, you know, Wake Tech is the, is the largest community college in the state. I, it's a great place to work. I've been very pleased with my experience there. I've been able to, well, Entrepreneurship Initiatives is a new role, is one that mm -hmm. I actually helped develop as a consultant. Didn't know I was going to end up with the job, but I'm very pleased that I, di that I did end up with the job because it's all about finding gaps in the entrepreneurial fabric in Wake County and developing something to fill that gap. So it really appeals to my entrepreneurial nature doing this job because I get to create things. Yeah. And uh, so you're, you're, the question that you asked me that, I have not answered yet was uh, what makes Wake Tech so good? Is that the question or? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think you have to have a really good leader. And I joined Wake Tech during Dr. Stephen Scott's tenure, a real visionary. Wake Tech experienced a lot of growth under his leadership. And we now have a new president, Dr. Scott Rawls, who is also very good and a visionary leader. So I think we really 
won the lottery when it comes to good leaders. Yeah. Because I think the leaders set the culture for the organization. Absolutely. Now, it doesn't hurt that we are in Wake County in the Triangle region of North Carolina. Right. <laughs> That's contributed to our success and our growth as well. A lot of your career sounds like it has been around small businesses. What was going on in your life where you decided to, it seems like the way you were talking, it was leave IBM and then go into a <laughs> consulting kind of, what was it about small business that was so appealing? Like what was, what was going on in your life that you're like, small business is good because you were working at a big business. Yeah, well, when I started my career at IBM, they were developing departmental systems or smaller computers. They were developing things that did not have to be um, water-cooled. Okay. Now, that, that may be before your time, but, you know, there was a time when computers took up a whole room and you had to have pipe water through it to keep it keep the uh, circuitry from mm -hmm. overheating. Mm -hmm. So IBM in the late 70s, early 80s, was getting into the departmental computer, small computer arena. Small back then was the size of a desk. Yeah. Not what you can hold in your hand. And um, so I got hired in there, into, into IBM, to work with small businesses. And my job was to, once a computer was sold, to go out and work with the customer to crawl through every aspect of their business and figure out what they should automate first. Hmm. So I learned a lot from that. So I started off in the small business arena, have always kind of been in the small business arena inside IBM. So it was not too too far off my skill set to when I left IBM to, to yeah. stay, stick with small business. So why do you like working with small business owners? You could you could choose to work in a lot of different fields. It sounds like what is it about? Well, the for, work? thank you for that compliment, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there's a certain degree of creativity and optimism that comes with starting a small business and being an entrepreneur. I like that energy. Yeah. Over the years, I think that I've come to appreciate the real role that small businesses play in in making healthy societies, healthy communities. Because if you start a coffee shop you're never going to outsource your workers to Bangladesh. Sure. Not picking on Bangladesh, could be any place. But small businesses usually create sticky jobs. And, and I define a job as sticky. It can't be easily moved someplace else. Mm. So, and you know, the statistics show that small businesses hire the most, create the most new jobs every year. And you see biz, big businesses, lots of times to solve their business problems, they're shrinking. Sure. So it's clear to me, and I think it's become clear to a lot of other people, if you look at the support that entrepreneurs and small businesses are getting from communities and from towns and from local governments now, that, that small business is the key to st stability. And so over you know, the span of your career, you've probably worked with hundreds of small businesses, maybe thousands, and gotten to consult maybe, or just mm -hmm. have conversations with a lot. I got a couple of questions, but one that I'm really curious about is, can you tell, like, right off the bat if somebody's got the goods? Business? Well, you at least need to have a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of keys that I've found to uh, whether or not people are going to be successful in their small business. Number one, they have to be coachable because things change all the time. Nobody has the magic answers. So people have to be willing to learn and to take advice. That's a strong indicator mm -hmm. they're going to have some issues. Yes, yes. And the other thing that I've found, especially people who've had a career in corporate America like I had, I tell people my body left IBM in 2006. My mind caught up in 2009. <laughs> there's a way of, there's a way you think when you've been an employee your whole life. Mm. When you are out on your own, you have to switch a lot of that thinking. Sometimes it's the exact opposite. For instance, when I was with IBM, the brand was IBM. And I needed to not do anything to mess that up, to not tarnish the brand. It wasn't me walking into a customer's office. It was the yeah. company IBM. You're so there was this rule that you created a healthy professional distance with your customers. Well, when you're in a small business, the brand is you. When you walk into a customer's office, you're representing yourself. And you want to get to know that customer very well because it's People to people is person to person, individual to individual, and they need to know, like, and trust you specifically. So that's one of those cases where the rules just flip. Yeah. The other thing is when you're in a big company, you can play who's got the monkey. 
<laughs> Have you ever played Who's Got the Monkey? No, but I like the title. Okay. The Who's Got the Monkey goes like this. We're working on the project together. Something needs to get done. I call you or an email you, and I leave you a message, and I ask you for something. Right. Okay. Somebody says, Katie, what's the status of so? Well, I, I called, and I emailed. And I've I often left, wondered if that had a name. Waiting. I love your name and, for it. And although you <laughs> never say that, it's basically say, hey, I did what I was supposed to do. He's got the monkey now. Right. And you can play that. But if you don't understand as a small business owner that you always have the monkey, Right. Then you'll end up in a situation where you're waiting for things that you shouldn't wait for. Right. For instance, I had a client one time who was starting a daycare center. It's a highly regulated industry in the state. You have to go to through the Department of Health and Human Services to get accredited and approved. And there are rules about how, how large it is. And you can't really open a daycare center without having a case manager assigned to you. And my assignment to my client was, Go to DHHS, get the big giant book that has all the rules, and get your case manager assigned. And we were meeting once a week. The next week's meeting comes along. Okay. What happened with DHHS? Did you get the book? Got the book? Downloaded it? Wonderful. What's happening with your case manager? Well, um, nothing. Why not? Well, I left a message, and I haven't heard back. Well, you mean you left a message? When did you leave a message? Last Tuesday. Now this is next Tuesday. So what are you waiting for? Well, I'm waiting for them to call me back. Well, why are you waiting? Well, because I don't want to annoy them. I don't want to upset them. I'm just waiting. Yeah. You know, you can't do that as an entrepreneur. As an entrepreneur, you'd call back the next day. You'd call back the next day. Then you'd call their supervisor or you go, you get in your car and actually go down there. Right. So she was playing who's got the monkey. She didn't realize that she had the monkey. So that's employee thinking. Yeah. So if I find somebody who is afflicted with employee thinking, I can recognize it because I was afflicted with that for three years too. Mm-hmm. Then I know they've got to get over that. Man, you just you just uh, like read my mail because I just quit my job in January to start. Congratulations! My company. Well, thank you very much, <laughs> and uh, it's been awesome. But I have noticed that I've been playing some who's got the monkey, mm. and because like, I guess when you work for an organization, right, you're getting paid either way. It's almost right. like this, like I'm getting paid either way. And as you as you branch out and you do your own thing, mm-hmm. you become painfully aware of what's billable and what's not right. and what your hourly rate is and what, what busy work is versus like what's work mm-hmm. that brings mm-hmm. in money. I'm still playing who's got the monkey a little bit more than I should on some certain issues. Yeah. Because it's it's a mindset. It's tough to get out it of. It really is a mindset. And it's one that you have to, if you've been an employee your whole life, Either you have to get your degree from the School of Hard Knocks and learn the hard way yeah. that you need to change your mindset, or you need to have somebody take you by the hand and say, okay, mm-hmm. this is what the new rules are. You know, yeah. uh, you're not in Kansas anymore. Right. <laughs> These are the new rules. That's awesome. I love that it has a name. Who's got the monkey? Because mm-hmm. yeah. I've really observed that. And as I Ooh, as you even work with clients. That sounds like the name for a great book. Yeah. <laughs> Who's got the monkey? Yeah. yeah, of course it you does. Should, you should rate that book. I should. And then you can come on and you can talk about your new book, Who's That's Got the right. Monkey. That I think I just got promised another interview once I write that book. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I think let that's me, what let me write that down. So I bet that you have, now that you're in this position where you get to mentor a lot of people and speak wisdom into experience and into, into situations, you had to have mentors in your life. What were some lessons you learned early on from mentors in your life? Well, I'd, I'd learned that you want to work at least as hard as the people around you. Because the the managers that I respected the most were the ones that I saw putting in the work. Mm. That doesn't mean 24-hour work. But if I saw somebody drinking tea and smoking cigars in the office all day and just giving me instructions, well, then um, they really didn't have my loyalty. Only the people who are willing to give you that support can, can tell you or can determine whether or not you'll be a leader. Yeah. You can be a manager. Because somebody appointed you and put your name in a certain box on the org chart. And some managers are leaders and some are not. So in my if my name is in that box in the org chart, I have authority because that's where my name is. Right. But if I'm a leader, I can accomplish things even if my name is not in that box. But if I'm a manager and a leader, wow, that's really powerful. 
I got so much I want to talk to you. I want to talk in a little bit, not right now, but I want to talk about all these awesome programs that, that you guys have started. The Launch, Carry Launch, Raleigh, and all the different cities that mm-hmm. are doing these awesome programs. And I think if you're listening and you're a small business owner, you, you need to know that these exist if you haven't heard about them yet. You're really in a unique opportunity as a person in our area, in our environment, in our economy, and what's going on here in Wake County and Cary and Apex and Raleigh to answer some pretty unique questions that I want to, that I want to pose to you here. Um, what do you think in our area are some of the advantages of being a small business versus being a large business? Well, first of all, let's define small business. The U S small business administration has defined a small business as a company with fewer than 500 employees. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a broad definition because the needs and behaviors of a business with four employees or less or one employee is very different even from the needs of a business with 10 employees or 20 employees or 50 or 250 and definitely 499. So it's a very broad definition. And sometimes I wish we would, we would break that up a little bit into tiers sure, so that we can talk more realistically yeah. about each one of the tiers. Yeah, absolutely. There's a huge difference between 350 employees and solopreneur. You know? <laughs> That's right. right. That's right. That's right. But it has the same name according to the Small Business, Small Business Bureau. Well, of course, there are advantages and disadvantages. One of the advantages is you get to do something and actually see the impact. Sometimes when you're in a large business, you can work very hard on something and hand it off and you may not see the 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 bottom line impu- impact of mm-hmm. what you've just done. Yeah. So one of the advantages you get to see the impact of your decisions. Yeah. You actually get to make some decisions. You probably for the most small businesses get to be a little bit more creative. You get to wear more hats. You're probably going to learn more. In a large business sometimes jobs are really broken down into itty bitty pieces. Mm-hmm. So if you're working in that small business, you're going to learn a whole lot more about both sales and marketing than you would if you're working in a large business and you're in your little slice of whatever that sales responsibility is. Right. The other advantage of a small business is reaction time. You can make a decision as a small business owner today yeah. and implement it tomorrow. Mm-hmm. That's not likely in a large business because you've got to go through the layers of approval. Now, there's a reason for that, of course. As a, as a small business owner, if I do something today and I want to change it tomorrow, then I can go ahead and change it. It hasn't reached 5 million people yet. And the couple of hundred or so that it reached, I can just send something out to them and tell them I'm changing it. Right. But if you're in a large, very large company and you make a decision today, it may go all the way over the world by tomorrow. And if you have to change it or if you made a mistake, then you got to try to push it all the way around the world again. Mm-hmm. So there's more of a risk in large business of making a mistake. So I understand that. But in a small business, you have the speed of execution on your side. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great way of saying it. Speed mm-hmm. of execution on your side. Mm-hmm. And if you think about it, a lot of the innovations that happen happen in the small business environment and get, and then adopted by yeah. big business. Yeah. So next question I have for you. In our area specifically, What are some of the top mistakes that you've seen small businesses make? I think one of the mistakes that all small business owners make starting out is we don't know our numbers. You know, every professional knows their numbers. Every professional athlete knows their numbers. Every person who's really got their finger on the pulse of their company knows their numbers. And sometimes small business owners don't know their numbers. Mm-hmm. They don't know, you know, exactly how many transactions do I need to process today? Exactly what are my costs? Exactly what profit margin do I need? And you have to eventually you have to get to the point where you know those numbers so that you can be successful in your business because you otherwise you're just kind of, you know, right. working on a wing and a prayer and, you know, just hoping things are going to work out right. Yeah. And I think that's not, that's one of the biggest mistakes. Do you think that's an extension of who's got the monkey? Like it was always somebody else's job in the in the previous life? Or or not mm, well, sometimes they just weren't in a position to to, to learn that. Mm-hmm. In their in their corporate job. Right. It just would have been maybe just a little esoteric to know exactly what the numbers were at the mm-hmm. company in your role and then you kind of transfer that information over. I find it fascinating that it took 
I love what you said about how your body left IBM in 2006 and then your brain came with you in 2009. Do you remember like the moment when it changed? What was going on? Were you like, oh, this is the light bulb came on, the catalyst for changing that mentality? I actually had a, I actually had a business coach. So I was a business coach mm-hmm. and I had a business coach. And somebody said, well, why? I introduced this person as my business coach and uh, a friend of mine said, why do you, why do you have a business coach? You are a coach. I said, yeah, but I can't see the top of my head. You know, there's a reason why brain surgeons don't operate on their own brain. Right. Mm-hmm. They don't have perspective on their brains. They can't see the top of their heads. They have to bring in another brain surgeon to operate on their brains. So my business coach was explaining this whole thing about employee thinking. And I saw myself so clearly. <laughs> <laughs> And so I had to have somebody tell me. It makes me admire business coaches. I meet a lot of business coaches Mm -hmm. out at networking events. And it makes me respect them and like them more when I find out that they have a business coach. Because what it tells me is that they believe in what they do and Mm -hmm. how it's useful Mm -hmm. and that it helps people. Mm -hmm. Because if they didn't have a business coach, it would make me question, like, why would I have one if you don't have one? That's Uh, right. (laughs) It's like going to the... um, Going to the LASIKs vision place and everybody's wearing glasses. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what do you guys know that we don't know? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think are some of the most critical skills that business owners today need to succeed? You ask very hard questions. That's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> but you, there's, the seat should be a different color, like red for the hot seat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. I actually was asked this question a few few weeks ago. and. You, you'd always talk, hear people talk about, well, they need to have good financial management skills. They need to have good people mm-hmm. skills. They need to have, but I think the, the core thing that small business owners need is curiosity and creative problem solving. If you want to know, if you're curious enough that you want to know and you want to find out, mm. then you're going to dig into things and you're going to be smart about what you're doing. You're going to le- really learn your business. Creative problem solving, that's a muscle. The more often you solve problems yeah. and use creativity to come up with some solutions and, and some ways around some obstacles, the stronger that muscle gets. So I think those two, curiosity and creative problem solving as the foundation things. It makes a lot of sense. And it should go in your book about uh, who's got the who's monkey. Who's got the monkey. Because <laughs> that's exactly the op. That's the way to get out of that mindset, right? Is mm-hmm. to be like, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to solve this problem. I'm not going to wait for somebody else to do it. It's not somebody else's job to figure it out. I want to, or you look at your business and say, this happened. Why? Mm-hmm. Why did it happen? Let me not make any assumptions. Let me go find out. And then often you'll dig down and you find out that the solution is something that you would not have thought about and would not have noticed if you've not been willing to dig. This show is produced at Podcast Carry, a professional studio making podcasting simple and fun. Located in Vibe Coworking in Cary, North Carolina. Want to start a podcast to create great content for your business and establish yourself as a thought leader in your city? Go to podcastcarry.com, connect with your audience, grow your brand. Well, let's jump into these launch programs. Okay. Tell us a little bit about Launch Carry, Launch Raleigh, all these awesome initiatives that okay. you guys have going. Okay. I've called it Launch Wake County. It, there's, a, there's a story behind this. And in 2016 is when we started working on the launch programs. And it was not my idea. And it is not my program. In 2016 guy named Matthew Kane from the North Raleigh Rotary Club was looking for something really significant to do for their 50-year anniversary. And he talked to Gene Tedrow, who is now director of the North Carolina Center for Nonprofits, about what she needed or what she saw as a need in Southeast Raleigh. And she mentioned that her then nonprofit that she was running called Passage Home had done a lot of work in that area, but they had not been able to really address entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And he said, ah, entrepreneurship. We'll do that. And she said, well, if you want to start an entrepreneurship program, you need to go talk to Katie at Wake Tech. So that's how I got, I was the third person pulled into this. We looked at a model that the Rotary Clubs in Detroit and Atlanta had used to bring more entrepreneurial activity to some neglected areas of their town. Mm -hmm. Like the model, we got together, we started working on it. We changed, changed some things about the model 
that we thought needed to be changing, and we introduced it in January of 2017 at Shaw University. And initially, it was just a cool thing that we were doing in Southeast Raleigh. We had eight collaborating partners. We were all so excited. It was like a startup, you know. Yeah. I'm wearing the orange hat today. Tomorrow, I'll wear the green hat. You wear the orange hat. I mean, not a lot of definition of roles and responsibilities, but all committed to the cause. Mm -hmm. At the end of March, when we graduated our first class, we knew we had something special. Mm -hmm. So we went back to Rotary International and said, can we put a website on your server called Launch My City? Because all these documents we've created, the templates, the timeline, the rules, we think any community can do this. All they have to do is look at what we've done. And the program had four parts. First part is training. Because people start businesses because they know how to do the stuff, make the thing. Mm -hmm. Not because they know how to do the business of the stuff right. or the thing. So the first is training. The second is mentoring. Everybody needs a mentor. People who have mentors are five times more likely to be successful. And a mentor is somebody who kind of takes you by the hand and says, I've walked down that path before. Let me show you. Mm -hmm. Then some networking, like some community, because isolation is a problem with entrepreneurship. You were in a business. You had people down the hall in the cubicle next to you. And now you're at home in the bonus room, and the only person you have is a cat. Right. right. So isolation is a problem. It solves that problem. And help finding a little cash if that's what you need. So those are the four, four components. People who had been in uh, mentors in Lodge Raleigh were also excited about it and went back to their communities and said, we want one of these here. So that's how it started spreading around Wake County. Yeah. It also spread beyond Wake County. So at our first meeting was somebody from Durham who went and did a launch program in Durham. I think they're like two now. One, one's called Launch Durham, one's called something else. There's a launch program in Rocky Mount, in Goldsboro, Richmond, Virginia. I think there's one in Florida, South Carolina. Denver, Lenawee County, Michigan, Toronto. Wow. I think that's it. And some, I talked to somebody from Texas a couple of weeks ago. But it's the model, it's the recipe. Well, you know when you share your recipe, sometimes people change it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, as people were taking the recipe and adapting it to their environment, they were changing it. And I started getting a lot of questions about why does yours look different from these and why, why are they doing this and you're doing that. So that's when I looked around Wake County and said, we've got some momentum here. I put it under an umbrella called Launch Wake County. So that's kind of how Launch Wake County developed. It started spreading organically. Wake Tech is proud to be kind of the consultant or facilitator for communities that want to do this. Mm -hmm. We're the official training partner, and we're the convening organization. For instance, we had our first reunion in August. We are now in seven towns. Yeah. And come December, we will have graduated 309 small business owners. Oh, wow. 309. That's yep. a milestone. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and that explains why I've heard about it so much yeah. through different yes. people that I've met who have been in the program or have heard good things about the program. It definitely is one of those things right now that it got my attention. I applied and I went to the the meeting um, a couple of weeks ago at Dorcas and uh, the people from the Rotary who were there really communicated a genuine sense of just wanting to help people out. Josh and I talk about like, we love story on here and mm -hmm. there's like every story has a guide. The person right. has been there, done that. It's not a mystery to them, but they're, they're here to help you become the hero in your story. And I really got that vibe from the gentleman yes. that we're sharing. And I myself feel like you you describe me probably in the same category as you describe many small business owners. Like I'm good at what I do, but the business side of it was never something that I went into it for. Need help, need training there. Mm -hmm. And also it was a pretty pretty packed house, which I thought was, so that makes energy, right? It does. It like an excitement level. And that energy comes from the fact that these programs are in the communities. Mm-hmm. None of the classes happen at Wake Tech, even though we are the training people who help with reunions. But really, the energy comes from the volunteers in the towns. Mm -hmm. And they reach out to other businesses in the towns to support the program. Yeah. There are costs beyond the training. Those teams find a way to pay for those costs. They get local businesses to, to give them their space for free to hold the classes. They get them to sponsor meals. By the way, part of the recipe is... There's dinner before every class. There's something about sharing a meal that bonds people. Yeah. They get a chance to talk about what's happening in their lives. 
they become friends because the point of this is not just to take a bunch of people and give them some training. The point is to create a community right. of entrepreneurs in that town that support each other and do business with each other. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, they have to have a relationship. That meal before class is where they develop yeah. those relationships. Do you have any favorite stories? Like out of 308, there's got to there be some pretty so amazing stories. There are so many favorite stories. When I came here, I just left the ribbon cutting for Sloan Signature Gifts. Sloan Signature Gifts. Yep. Marla Sloan was in the Launch Apex second class, second cohort, and I ended up being her mentor. I'm not bragging about her just because I mentored her, but she moved here from, Marla moved here from California. In California, she had a gift business, and she thought she would do that same thing here, and she was looking at doing fundraising, using her gifts as fundraisers. Of course, we changed that. Her, her business name was Mojo Gifts, and we changed that. So... Today, she did a ribbon cutting on Sloan Signature Gifts, and it's a different business than what she started off with, but she's doing very well with it. She has some very unique things, and she, and it was a packed house for her ribbon cutting. Yeah. And many of the people there were people who were in class with her mm -hmm. in Launch Apex. Another story, well, I'm thinking about, about him just because he's, he spoke at the Launch Raleigh class last night, one of the classmates who owns Oak City Coffee Roasters. Mm. So we don't just help people who just started a business or have a business idea we also help people who have established businesses and maybe they've hit a wall yeah and bill said last night that he went into it because of the class he went into a meeting with a potential large corporate company corporate uh, client that could buy volumes of a new product that he's introducing and he was so proud he went into that meeting he knew his numbers he knew his, exactly what his net income was uh, percentage and profit margin he knew that because of the work he'd been doing in the class so are these programs for folks who are enrolled in Wake Tech or just anyone? that These are community-based programs. Now, I do have some things that I do with the students that are enrolled as degree seekers mm -hmm. or in uh, some of our adult continuing education classes. Mm -hmm. But this is, these are community-based programs for people out there in the community. The, communi the role of the community college is economic development. So it's not just about giving somebody a two-year degree. Mm -hmm. It's about helping that county grow. So can I step back and talk about community colleges in general? Yeah, for a while? absolutely. Because it's amazing how many people don't understand the community college system in North Carolina. And we are the envy of the rest of the country. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we have 58 community colleges to serve 100 counties in North Carolina. That's wealth. Mm. Everybody in North Carolina can get to a community college. Yeah. And every community college has three areas. There's the traditional two-year degree programs. There are things called career programs like construction management, automotive, plumbing, all of the trades, culinary, graphic design, game development. Those people don't need to transfer. They've got their, their credentials that will allow them to get right into the workforce. Mm -hmm. That's one side of the house, the degree programs. There's the adult continuing education side of the community college that serves professionals who are spiffing up their capability. They could be taking a class that helps them with their current job, or they may, maybe they're going for a certification to get a different job. Um, maybe their company has hired the community college to come in and train a bunch of people. So there's that piece. Then there's a side of the college that serves businesses. So the college is an economic development tool for the county where it's located. In North Carolina, we are assigned a geographic territory. Some community colleges have multiple counties because the population is not as dense. But from where we sit today, you can easily drive to five community colleges. Another thing that every community college has is a small business center. And the small business centers are funded by state taxpayer dollars to do two things. And it's all free, what the small business center provides. Confidential one-on-one -on -one counseling. So anybody with a pulse can walk into, can set up an appointment with a community college small business center and get some help with their business or with their idea, whatever their issue is around that business. The small business centers also provide seminars and webinars. And these are two-hour chunks of very targeted information aimed at the small business owner. Our community college, uh, our small business center actually does some things at Vibe, partners with all the chambers, and with a lot of other community organizations to also take those seminars out there into the community. Mm. What I do 
here with the launch program and entrepreneurship initiatives, I'm always collaborating with the small business center because when those people finish their time, their six months with their mentor in the large program, they still need help. Yeah. Their business is going to keep growing. They go to our small business center for that ongoing help. So I say, you know, once you come to Wake Tech for small business help, we like the mafia. <laughs> mm. Once you're in, you can never get out. <laughs> I like that. I bet a lot of people don't know that. Thanks so, so much for sharing yeah. that. That you're you're actually paying in tax money for this resource for the small business center. That's Use right. It. And uh, and there are 58 of those small business centers. Uh, Our director's name is Cherith Robertson. I always have to talk about because they're such a great partner and they they enable me to do what I do because we have some place we can feed those sure. those entrepreneurs into. And our small business center offers 120 to 140 seminars a year. Wow. Just as, as resources. As resources. Free hate of to charge. Them. Yeah, they're free to you, but, I mean, you pay for them. I mean, That's right. You, you might yeah. as well so take if, advantage if, of them. If you're not using them, you're losing money. That's right. You're mm-hmm. losing money. Now, with the large programs, I raise private, private dollars for the training okay. that we provide. And the, and the teams within the towns, they raise money for their website, for sure. their printing, for their meals, and the like. What are some of the common questions that people might come into the Small Business Center and say, I'd like to meet with somebody and I'd like to talk about... Anything's on your head, you can come in. Either either we have the answer, or we can point you to the resource, or it's no, don't do that. Sometimes <laughs> that's the answer. But we get anything from the 23-year-old that came in one time and said, I've always wanted to, to have my own business. And I said... What were you thinking about? Well, I don't know. What do you think I should do? That to the person with the patentable idea for creating over-the-county drugs at a 30% reduced cost and needs a million dollars. It's the whole gamut. Wow. And lots of times a small business center is like the, the emergency room, like triage. The person comes in and the small business center counselors kind of diagnose what their needs are. Yeah. And then can refer them to other resources if the small business center doesn't have everything that they need. Yeah. We had a business coach on once and he had a great piece of advice. I don't know if you remember, but I think it was Dave Bates. He was talking about like, if you really want to engage a business coach, please don't wait till the wheels fall off the wagon. That's right. Mm. Do it when things are healthy, when things are good. And I bet mm-hmm. that's, that's great advice for people to approach the small business center. You're like, you don't have to wait until the wheels fall off. Right. You can go take advantage of the resource and maybe the wheels won't fall off. Right. Let's talk specifically about the one at Wake Tech. Where is the small business center. And how do you make an appointment? Uh, well, people can um, just go to SBC, as in small business center, dot wagetech dot edu to get to the website. And there will be some buttons. There is a free seminars button and a free counseling button. <laughs> just click on whichever one you want. The lo- The office location is at our Western Wake campus in Cary. Okay. Which is on the in the shopping center, Mill Pond Village, on the mm-hmm. corner of Kildare Farm and 1010. Yeah. They got a great but, Starbucks there. But our counseling, here again, is the philosophy that we've adopted. If you take the resources to the community, the counseling happens all over Wake County. Okay. And a lot of it is done by Zoom or by telephone. What are some of the, the pro tips for working with, with Wake Tech? I hear a lot of people say things like along the lines of, and I know I want to encourage my daughters, like before you jump right into a university, I would love them to explore the community college first and pick up some of their early credits. I know that's a common practice that some people do. It, it's becoming more common, and it's, it really makes a lot of sense mm-hmm. for a student to get some college credits while they're in high school, if they're inclined. And a lot of that is uh, done online. And we wish more students would take advantage of that. Wake Tech serves about 76,000 people a year. Mm. And last year, we were named the number one online community college in the nation. Right, right. So, oh, really? I, yeah, as you can tell, I'm a, I'm a bit of a fan. That's quite a big um, award. Yes. Wow, that's impressive. We, and we have a lot of really cool programs, too, that, you know, outside of what I do and what yeah. Cherith does in the Small Business Center, there are so many cool things happening, like yeah. one of my favorite things, Fostering Bright Futures. Yeah. If you've ever been in the foster care system, you can come to Wake Tech Fostering Bright Futures and get help getting your education. But once they're in Wake Tech, we help get a car, they get a laptop, they get a cell phone allowance, they get help with housing, they get help with child care if necessary, they get paid for good grades, and they get basically a support system wrapped around them because if you've been in the foster care system, you may not have the support system that some of the other students enjoy. Yeah. And that's one of my favorite things that we do. We also have, as of 2016, a 
Military and Veterans Resource Center that is a physical place that is a one-stop shop for veterans who are coming to Wake Tech to take classes. If you are a veteran, you can get a special emblem on your name badge so that you can identify each other as you go across campus. And on many of our campuses, we have reserved parking for vets. Nice. And we are a certified green zone, meaning it's a safe place yeah. for vets, even if, you know, vets with PTSD and the other. You guys still doing the Motorcycle Safety Foundation course at Wake Tech? Are you familiar with that? That's probably far away from your uh, circle, mm-hmm. but yeah. I taught that course in uh, other states when it was private private schools taught it but it's Mm -hmm. tied in with the dmv but when i came home to north carolina i discovered that you want to get a motorcycle endorsement you can go through the safety course which is offered by wake tech Mm -hmm. which is in collaboration with the motorcycle safety foundation and the department of motor vehicles which is pretty cool i I don't know i had a friend who went through that years ago i don't know if we still do that what we do though with safety we have a campus that's that's dedicated to public safety professionals our public safety education campus, we train almost all the police officers, sheriffs, deputies, firemen. We have a firing range in the basement. Um, nice. That location is also where we have our barber school. A lot of people don't realize we have a barber school oh. there. Yes. In fact, oh my goodness, this is so exciting. So the barber school started with the vision of infusing entrepreneurship into the curriculum because these guys are entrepreneurs even if they don't realize it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When they get out, they get their chair, that's their business. Well, I had a chance to go in and teach entrepreneurship to the very first barber school mm. class to graduate. And mm. one of those graduates is starting his business. I mean, he's opening his own shop this Saturday. Yeah. That is so exciting. Yeah. Huh. And, what, I wonder what kind of scissors he's going to use for the ribbon cutting. I don't know. I hope he's got one of those big ones and not try to use his little bitty scissors. Yeah. But but I'm really excited for him. He was he was uh, one of those people in the class that was very serious and very dedicated. He yeah. graduated. He went and he had to, to apprentice for a while. Yeah. That's got to be very rewarding work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's very exciting. Thank you so much what you do for the community and for bringing these resources to our attention. I'll put some links in the show notes about the small business and all the opportunities that you have there, either to set up counseling or to attend one of their many free classes. Definitely something worth checking out. You're already paying for it. The best way to... That's right. I know. Best You're not using it. You're losing, money. Money. You're losing money. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's Thank right. you so much for bringing You're this welcome. stuff to our attention. And I was I was really excited to get to talk to you, and I learned way more than I thought I would. Yeah. Likewise. Oh, is there gonna, like going to be a like a cupcake or something? I'm just uh. right now. <laughs> bring, bring it in, crew. <laughs> we love making this stuff for you. You can help us out by subscribing wherever you get your podcasts. Get unstuck. Tell a better story and have a good answer to the question: What are you doing today?